The word is frockopter, which is to say, uh, it's translated many times as um, to proceed, to profit, even to wax. But really, it means, it means, and you'll find in your Strong's, it says to get ahead as if by beating, to go forward as by beating. So you have a little bit of effort involved with this, but I want to take it even deeper than that. I want to go back into the etymology and um, how the word came to be. It was an old nautical term. Nautical means having to do with sailing, all right, or a ship. And what the word really meant is to make headway in spite of the blow. That means whichever way the wind is blowing from, it doesn't matter, we're going to make headway. Now, sometimes with a ship, I don't know how many of you are sailors or have ever sailed a sailing vessel, but to go into the, directly into the wind, and as much as the wind is driving you, you have to tack. And that means cut a 45 degree angle or so, go this way, and then tack back, and you can sail right into the wind. Many times in your life, you have adversity. You've got to know how to tack. You've got to know how to go ahead regardless of the blow. That's to say which way the wind's blowing from. If it's head on, tack, go around, cut, do your 45 or whatever you can stand before you flip over. And, and uh, as you can tell, I'm an old sailor. I've, I've been there. I've flipped a few times, too. But that happens in life also. Just don't get greedy with, with progress. You know, don't go ahead faster than God's natural laws allow you. In other words, if you get too much wind in that old topsail and jib, and, and um, um, you're not to your center and has already met its water loo, water bound. Okay, so there you go. And um, so that word is used several times, and usually it has to do with either your enemy or you. And you're getting ahead. And as long as you keep your head, you're going to be just fine. There's also an old metaphor, a Greek metaphor. It goes something like this. It says, uh, this, with the smith's hammer, each time he beats, the iron grows longer. Okay, you got that? It's, a, it's an old Greek metaphor, and sometimes it's hard to make a trans, you know, to translate a figure of speech or a metaphor, but each time the, an, the smith hits the anvil, the iron grows longer, and that means when you heat up a strip of metal, if you beat it out, naturally it lengthens. So sometimes to get ahead, you've got to do what? You've got to beat the daylights out of it, okay? Using common sense, of course, that is the etymology of this word, is to get ahead when things get going a little rough, you know, people, 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 people will hit a little adversity and they're going to hold this, the whole world, attack, 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 you know, handle it, do something, don't just stand there and complain, get around it, or go under it, over it, or through it, but don't complain about it, get ahead. But it's always best to use the old nautical term, tack always works best. And that word using tack, it's not the same word, but we'll, we'll, we'll make hay while the sun shines. Sometimes tack can get you around a person that really dislikes your attitude. Why they would do that, I have no idea, because look at all your attitudes. They're wonderful. But sometimes, but you can use just a little tack and... Sometimes sugar makes the medicine go down a lot better, okay? And um, you husbands here, it's Father's Day. You know how to get along with your wives, okay? Well, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't hurt to do that. Now, this is the message our Father on Father's Day left us as far as getting ahead is concerned. You've got to think. Stop and think. And you know... I, I suppose Father puts us, as we're going to find Paul, some of Paul's writings, and says, hey, it was rough, but I always grew by it. It always made the message a lot better. And I think sometimes when God puts us through something, you take some of us old combat veterans, and I'm not going to tell war stories today, 
But sometimes if your life can be snuffed out at any instant, you know what trouble is. Okay? A lot of people don't know what trouble is. They just think they do. Okay? But now, if you ever get in a spot like that where at any instant a dream can come through and you're gone, you're dead, you know, then you've got trouble. So you better use your head and you better tack and you better be smarter than the enemy. You better be better than he is. Better equipped, uh, better trained, the whole bit, all right? But now, that's trouble. And people are looking forward to the end of this age, and they've never been in combat or anything other than maybe their driving would be more frightening than the front line, but anyway. <laughs> um, you know, what are you going to do? There's an old saying, if you can't get along and walk with the cavalry, what, I mean, the infantry, what in the world are you going to do when the cavalry comes? What are you going to do when the Antichrist is here if you gripe at every little old time it rains or on your parade or something like that without, hey, if it rains on your parade, hold that flag up there, get your shoulders back, straighten up and go. Go ahead. Make, make the best of every situation. That's what God wants for his election, all right? Not a bunch of poor new babies. He just can't handle dealing with poor new babies. Why? Because he gives us so much. And that's one reason I wanted to hinge on this one little Greek word today and, uh, and use it through the scriptures and see if we cannot gain a little bit of knowledge as to how to tap to make life better for us. Open your Bibles to the great book of Luke, chapter 1. Christ has just made his first trip to Jerusalem. His parents are heading back home. And as the Son of Man, that's to say when Christ walked the earth in flesh, you will hear his first words in flesh as they were used. Verse 44 reads of Luke chapter one, 2. I'm sorry, look at Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, verse 44, and it reads, But they supposed, this would be Mary and Joseph, they supposed him to have been in the company, they're returning back home, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. It was quite a group. And they had noticed him. They had missed him. 45, talking of Jesus, of course. 45. And when they found him not... They turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. Naturally, this frightened them. How many of you have ever lost a child for a few moments? Hey, it's scary, okay? It makes you uneasy. 46, and it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple. I like that three-day period. His ministry would be three years, and the final test would be three and a half times there. They found him in the temple. Where? Temple. Where would you expect to find him? Sitting in the midst of the dock doors. I mean, we're right uptown with the head modocs here, all right? Both hearing them and asking them questions. And uh, verse 47, and all they heard, all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. He thought things through, beloved. Not to say that he was the Son of God. And um, verse uh, 47. And when they saw him, they were amazed. That's to say his mother and Joseph. And his mother said to him, Son, now bear in mind, she's a mama that's had a kid missing for a while, okay? She's, she's not exactly, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy, okay? So... Father's Day or not, that's the way it is, okay? Even on Father's Day that applies, okay? Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. We were worrying ourselves to death over you. And what was his first words? 49. And he said unto them, How is it that you sought me? Question. 
Wished ye not that I must be about my father's business? I want you to note both his earthly father is mentioned, that is to say, stepfather, if you like, if an adopted father, however, whatever you want to call it, Joseph, and his heavenly father, which is father of us all, in verse 49, be about my father's business. I think it's important that you make a note of that and grow by it, because this being his first words, what was his last? As the Son of Man, now stay with me, you know what that term means. Son of Man means Christ in the flesh, all right? Not after the resurrection. But what was his final words in the flesh? It is finished. Meaning what? Father's business, of course. That's what he came here for. Emmanuel, God with us. Okay, so his first and last words, I'll be about my father's business. Last word, it is finished. That segment of it had he been. Verse 15. And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. 51. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. I mean, he was a good boy. He obeyed them. He minded them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart, in her mind. She locked these away, as a mother will. And mothers always do this. Verse 52. And this is why we came here. Listen carefully. And Jesus increased, underline that word in your mind, increased in wisdom and stature, that's to say with age, he matured, and in favor with God and man. The word increased in the Greek is prokopso, or prokoptu, okay, which means get ahead by tacking into the wind, to get ahead by beating as a piece of iron to make it longer to get ahead by a little beating this way or that way. In other words, it wasn't all that easy for him. I mean, there he was a carpenter's son, and he had to get along with everyone as he was maturing and aging and so forth. So I, I suppose the point I want you to draw from this is even for Christ himself. I mean, after all, you do know they did crucify him. I hope you don't think that was easy. Of course it wasn't. He didn't have it all that easy. And some people say, I wish I could follow in Christ's footsteps. Honey, you couldn't handle it. Okay? It would be too tough for you. It would for many people. So if you ever pray that prayer and your life just goes to shambles right after it because you're not uh, handling the beating quite sufficiently, you're not tacking and being wise, don't blame anyone but yourself. If you pray to walk in Christ's footsteps, hey... He took it. He knew how to handle it. And he parred when he had to. He sparred when he had to. By that I mean rolled with the situation and always had the upper hand. You can in life also. How do you do that? Well, by God's word, of course. And we want Galatians chapter 1. And here we're getting right down where Paul lives, okay? Now think about this a moment. How's your life today? How are you doing? Well, let's, let's check old Paul out. Okay. Verse 13, verse 1. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews religion, or the religion of Judah, which would be the teachings of Moses and so forth, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Oh, I was doing right, okay? I, I was really mean and tough in there. But there's one thing I don't want you to overlook. Is that while he was in the religion of Judah, that man memorized, basically, the Old Testament. Don't you ever think he wasn't a scholar? He was a scholar. He was well trained. Paul was so zealous. But he never did something halfway. So it's important that you know when he says, I was um, in a past how beyond measure I persecuted, because, because he believed what he was doing was right. Okay? He studied at the feet of Daniel, which was one of the greatest Hebrew scholars of that day. So don't ever think that Paul just 
we why am I doing this? Well, occasionally people will say, I'm like Paul, I didn't have to study just that on the road to Damascus. It all appeared to me. Baloney! That's not what happened to Paul. If you think that, you've got to study to be familiar with God's Word. All right? God won't use you otherwise. Not, not for anything of any depth, anyway. Do you know why? You don't know what's going on in the Word. You can't help someone. You can't change their lives with man's words. It's got to be God's Word. That is, it takes not one whit away from the Holy Spirit that can touch and heal and warn and guard and protect. But he does that to his servants that are able to handle the Word. That is to say, I don't mean handle it to the point maybe of being a teacher, but to know and understand the basic formula that God has placed forth, teaching you how to talk to be successful. It's necessary. Right? Paul continues then in verse 14. And profited in the Jewish religion, that's to say Jewish religion, Judah's religion, Eurus in the Greek, above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous. In other words, I drove myself harder. I studied harder. I learned of the traditions of my fathers. Do you know what that word profitable is? Prophet and leather. You got it. Prokopter. In other words, I needed ahead. I tacked ahead. I dealt with it. It didn't come easy. I worked at it. So, uh, when someone tells you, 15, this is where some people get off. I think I'll take this a verse or two further than I really intended to call it a digression. I'll risk it. 15. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. And many people right there say, I see that Paul didn't mean to confer with flesh and blood. The Holy Spirit touched him and he had it and he was off and running. But you're overlooking the, the, the Word, if that's what you would believe. Because he mentioned how hard he studied, how zealous he was. And many might say, well, why didn't he study the New Testament instead of the Old? <laughs> it didn't exist yet. <laughs> he was in the process of writing it. <laughs> Paul wrote most of it. But he did study the Word of God that was present at that time, and he was very familiar. All he needed was just a little touch of fine-tuning. Like that bolt on the road to Damascus, that'll fine tune your day, friend. Okay? When God Himself speaks to you, He will get your attention. All right? And you won't say, Ah, they were right. <laughs> It'll be yes or no. All right? He'll get your attention. So, don't ever, I mean, why am I saying this? You've got people coming along in these end times, beloved, that are going to try to twist your ear. Was saying a, a light out of the blue came to me, and I began to prophesy. And I have great, wonderful things that are far better than any man or right out of the word itself. If you would listen to something like that, then we wasted our time studying God's word because you can be had easy. What in the world are you going to do when the real false Messiah comes? You'll listen to anything if you'll listen to bubbleheads instead of God's word. Think things through. You're in that generation where this becomes very, very important. That you concentrate, focus. Hey, don't listen to this man or any other man without checking him out. And you know what will delight me more than anything is to see you go to the depth and check out proc up to, to prove I might be just snowing you all. Okay? Could be, you know, but I guarantee you I'm not. But if I can drive you that deep, I've succeeded. Because it very definitely lets you know you've got to maneuver to get ahead. You've got to think. You've got to do a little digging, 
and a little dragon is according to which way the wind blows. You've got to beat the iron to make it a little longer. You've got to study to show yourself approved. From what word? God's word. Hold your focus. Always hold that focus. All right, so Paul is letting you know. I just don't want anyone to ever twist the scripture on you on that fact. To say, well, it just came to Paul, and it came to me just like it did to Paul. There is no man living today that was a scholar. I don't believe that Paul was in the Old Testament. Bar none. He was so zealous. Why do you think God chose him? He knew the word. He was, I speak the language is better than all of you. And I'd rather have five words called to you than a thousand words a jumble. Right? He knew the languages, the tongues, okay? Okay, let's, let's go to the past right behind the Ephesians. We're going to Galatians, Ephesians. We're going to go to Philippians here. Just want to put a few of these points together, and then we're going to do a little study on it here. Let's go with uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 11. Okay. Again, Paul, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. How, how do you bring these fruits of righteousness? By who? By Jesus Christ, of course. The glory and praise of God. Twelve. But I would ye should understand, brethren that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. Now I'm going to give you one guess what this word furtherance is in the Greek. You got it. Prokopto. Okay. Feed it, jib it, dab it, drag, drag, whatever it takes, get it done. Okay? He said, those things that happened to me Beating, shipwreck, everything, it helped me gain stronger knowledge to know God's in control. So don't fall apart. Don't let them see you sweat on your first cruise, you know. It's all right to shake a little every once in a while when you're real scared and you think things are real bad. It's not that bad with God in control, okay? If you think... If you utilize the knowledge and wisdom that he gives you from his words. There's one more verse in this book. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the power, uh, place, powers, and in all other places. In other words, that the teaching Christ got in his. Paul had a lot of opposition. He had teachers that would teach, but Paul's not this and not that. Didn't matter. He tacked around it. He made fools out of them, okay? By, by what? Being real shrewd? No, by focusing and staying with the Word of God. That's true wisdom, beloved. Sometimes, I don't know what it is that makes man think, well, there's got to be something that's really mystical out there. Hey, you're asking for trouble. When you start looking at the mystical parts of the world, pretty soon I'll, I'll sell you Easter. Easter, you know. Show you what she did out here in the woods. You buy it. There's you know, little music out there, twenty do, you know, and turn it up so high that you can't think. You know, when we can culture your mind where we cram anything we want into it. And have a, have a bunny hopping, you know. And you've heard of the bunny club. And the boys go, and they forget all about God's Word. Okay? I mean, that's what the mystics ultimately will lead you off into. See, it doesn't happen. Okay? Cut it out. You don't need it. The things that God has given us are far more beautiful than what Easter does out in the woods. All right? And far better, more tasteful, more, more, um, whatever. Okay? It's great. <laughs> great it is. All right. Yeah. So, what did Paul say here? Hey, he said, these hard things make me better. Now, I want you to just take a moment and think back in your life. 
some time you thought you were really in trouble. And you prayed. And you worked. You didn't give up. And finally, you were worried over nothing. It just worked out just like that. It just came to pass and there was nothing to worry about. Who did you think did it? Who do you think helped you? Tax. Who do you think helped you zigzag? Your father did, of course. Father's Day is a good day to talk about that. Your father loves you. Not many people may love you. You know? And maybe we can understand why not many people love you. But God loves your father, okay? And I'm just talking to those that might be a little down. You know what I mean? That might think, well, the whole world's just jumping all over me. It isn't. If you let me ask you something, You're, I want to make an analogy, and let's say that it's not exactly it's as cold a night as you thought it was, and you've got comforters all over your bed. You are just smothered. Maybe Granny put the old feather bed on top of all that, you know, to keep you toasty. What do you do in your sleep when it begins to get too hot? You start kicking. You start throwing. And pretty soon it looks like somebody had a fight in your bedroom that night, you know. But you do it in your sleep. You take care of yourself, okay? You move till you get comfortable. Now, if your flesh can do that, think how much your spiritual body can do, okay? Man, hey, you can cut it. You are who is. You are something else. When you practice the Word of God, it's awesome. It really is. When you exercise the power and authority that your Father has given you to zig and to zag, you know, you can go around it, over it, or through it. It doesn't matter. Whichever seems the best at the moment, do it. And you'll always get ahead. That's God's promise. Okay, now we're going to go to First Timothy. Let's go back to... Philippians, we're going to go past Colossians, Thessalonians, and then we got 1 Timothy there. And in 1 Timothy, we're going to the fourth chapter. We're just kind of moving along here, doing a little digging and zagging in the Scripture, because I want to play on this one word to show you that it takes a little authority on your part to do a little pushing. And if you think I'm telling you you've got to be mean and rough, you're not getting the message, okay? I'm telling you to be smarter than the serpent, okay? That's the only way we can beat him. And hey, if you have to kick the serpent's head in occasionally, do it, okay? There's a bunch of snakes. They'll be enough to go around, okay? So <laughs> do what has to be done and is right for the occasion in the moment. That's called tacking. A little zigging, a little dragging. Verse 13 of chapter 4 in First Timothy. And here we're going to take kind of an opposite side here. 13. Till I come, give attendance to reading. I mean, do it publicly even if you must. Reading what? Well, I'll give you one guess. To exhortation. To doctrine. What doctrine? God's Word. Give heed to it. Pay attention. Base your instructions on God's Word and you can't go wrong. Plant a seed on God's Word, correctly translated, correctly utilized, and you'll always give good advice. Period. Fourteen. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery, presbytery, that's the elders in the body, the teachers, and so on and so forth, that meditate. What, what is meditate? Think. Use your wit. Upon these things, give thyself wholly to them. Don't let yourself get sidetracked. Get off in a quiet place. That the profiting may appear to all. We know what that word profiting is. Okay? We know what it means. Well, naturally. It is that word again. Profiting meaning the, that by beating and getting ahead, 
may appear to all that they know you can cut it. They know you know what you're talking about. Why? Well, why would they know that? Because you've meditated, you've concentrated, you've examined and researched, and you've stuck to the doctrine of Almighty God. Who do you think the prophets are that prophesied? Isaiah, Daniel, Ezekiel. It's all written. You, you've been foretold by God's Word. So you don't need to worry about it. You're not going to get left behind. You're not going to miss something. God has laid it all out for you. But He's telling you sometimes you've got to dig and drag a little. You've got to be able to push back. You've got to stand up. And you've got to take what's yours by the promises and the authority that He has given you. The gift that He has instilled in you. What gift is that? If he says, if you do these things, I will give you this and I will give you that. If you will concentrate and meditate on my word so you'll know what to do with it after you get it. Okay? So many people, they're so short-minded, they think, and selfish perhaps. God, give me a million dollars. Do you know something? A million dollars is just enough to get some people in trouble. Okay? It really is. It's not that much money. You know, you can lose a million dollars in one day. Okay? Sometimes as many television stations as I have, I, as we're on, I think we almost spend that much in, in one day. We do spend that much in one month. So, hey, it, a million is not that much money. You know? So, and, but God is giving you something that's more precious. Wisdom. How to get it for yourself. I'm not talking about money. Money, God will give that to you. Hey, he, he, he loves to take care of his own. But first, you've got to get it out of your mind being selfish and think about your brethren and love them. But sometimes people say, well, that means you can go to the brother and say, Oh, dear brother, they're your smoking pot and God loves you. That's not Christian. You say, get that stuff out of your mouth, your face, it's cooking your brain, brother. God loves you, and you're a sinner indeed. You can be head for anything puffing on that stuff. Yeah. Now, that's love. That's real love, you know? Because you know what he's going to do to you? <laughs> when you practice tough love, he's probably going to come back tough loving, but you better zig and zag. Get behind him where you're in good shape. Take your number 13 and whammo, you know, teach him a good lesson. Now, I'm not telling you to be brutal or anything like that, but what I'm saying is being a Christian takes a little zigging and a zagging and a little firmness. This Father's Day, fathers love their children. But have you ever heard of the woodshed, that place of discipline, where old Papa gets you back out there and when I do, do you know why he does that? Because he loves you. Oh, now you try to tell a kid that, so it's just been, and he'll understand, okay? He'll grab Papa and that. Well, Papa, I won't do that anymore. I love you, Papa. Children love discipline, you know? Well, we do when God disciplines, disciplines us, and that's what Paul was talking about a moment ago when he said, Hey, I'm growing by this. These hardships help me. Don't think God doesn't know your life and leave the control thereof, okay? But um, he wanted this Parteta to show to all people the fact that he could get ahead. Why? It set an example. But what did he do? He meditated on what? The Word. Well, Paul was good at it. Okay? Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. That's to say the teaching, the Word. Continue in them, for in doing this, doing what? In continuing studying, meditating in the Word, the doctrine, this thou shalt both save thyself. Doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. It'll change their lives, beloved. Now, what do you want to be? What do you want to do? You want to do a little digging, a little dragging, beat the iron a little bit, make it longer to fit the occasion? Or do we want to sit down and cry for a while? 
We could just sit down and all have a big cry and go home and have dinner. But what good would that do if you don't practice what God has taught you? You handle it. Does it do any good? There's nothing wrong with the emotion of tears, all right? Bless your heart, it's, it's, uh, it's healthy. But don't let it end there. That's what I'm saying. Everything is for a purpose. God is making up an army in heaven, and boy, he's picking the best for it. And he's making up an army here. I don't know which one we'll serve in. God knows. That's his business. But we're putting together an army that's of uh, our fathers that's going to bring Satan's little cl- the clothes of his and turn out his lights and pull the shades, okay? He's going in the abyss, and our Father teaches us how to do it. I guarantee you he won't go if he just got some things. Satan, let me give you a track here, okay? You know what this track says? It says you're going to hell. That's right, Satan. You, you might as well get it in your head now. You're going to hell, so just go ahead and jump in the pit, Okay? How long do you think Satan would listen to that? Whew. Satan would start licking his chops. <laughs> Boy, he's got me a dummy here. Okay. And, and I'm not making fun of certain religions here. I'm just saying when you meet fire, face it with what? Fire. Okay? Zig, zag. Stay in control. Okay, uh, we're First Timothy. Let's go to Second Timothy. We're just about to we'll get this down, and we're going to wind it up here. I think everybody's got the point, how to zig and zag. We're going to do some exercises when we get through here, okay? <laughs> I just... Chapter 2, verse... Um, we're just going to read two chapters here. I mean, two verses here, 15 and 16. Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study, you wonder what that is. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Now, wait a minute. Now, stop and think a moment. Who do you want to be approved of by? Man? My neighbor? I want to show them, John says. No, that isn't what it said. Approved of unto God, your Father. Okay? Keep God happy, and you don't worry so much about other people, all right? Because if you do it God's way, the people that should be happy with you will be, and those that shouldn't, pay. Hey, so heck with them. We don't care right now, okay? A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. What does that rightly dividing mean? It means outline it, divide it. So who is it needing to? That's part of dividing. You've got to know. Who is it written to? What time segment is referring to? Is it a type or is it prophecy? Is it history or is it prophecy? The history therefore becoming a type that shows you exactly how it's going to go down. Prophecy, oftentimes using examples or illustrations that we have to understand, like candles, sticks, simulations, and so forth. Right? But... Um, we, we think on those things, okay? But, um, and that's the way we grow. Dividing the word means to divide it whereby you understand it. Example, example. The book of James written to those that are scattered abroad. Well, if you didn't know that, who are those scattered abroad? Well, I hope you've studied with me long enough to know he's talking about the ten tribes. That's who it's written to. So don't try to make it fit someone else, though it is good for edification, correction, and so forth. But rightly divide it by knowing who it was written to, so that you gain more from it, okay? Example, that's one reason I recommend the Companion Bible. It gives you an outline by a scholar I highly um, trust. Didn't know everything, but then who does? I sure don't, do you? I one of the you know to spend time with those that know everything but think they know everything that's torture. <laughs> it really is real torture. Verse sixteen. But shun. Now, now you hear him, boys. 
but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Guess what that word increase means? You got it. Proc opto, which means what? It's going to get worse and worse, and they're going to be making headway every way they can. They're going to zig, they're going to zag. You know? Profane people that dream up doctrines. We receive about 50 volunteers for the two witnesses every year. Right? And even get videos saying, this is what we are. Well, they're ignorant of God's Word, and they wouldn't say such a dumb thing. That's not how the two witnesses come, you know. A man of God knows the two witnesses when he sees them. But I, I don't know. I think all told we've had about 1,875 volunteers for the two witnesses. But you see, it isn't up to us to pick. God has always done that. And we'll know them when we see them. Boy, the power they will have, okay? But you get these freakos that will play something, I don't know, I'm, I hope they don't get too close to the loony farm because you know what will happen to them, they'll shut them up in the coop, you know, and uh, maybe that's a good place for them. But you're going to have more babbling come along, I don't know, do you listen to junk? Or do you meditate on the Word of God and believe it and understand it, okay? That, don't be fooled. Satan loves fools, but you can document it, you can read it right here. Beware. Most of this stuff we take care of behind the scenes that you're never aware of it. It even gets threatening at times. You know what? Is that fun? Not really. But the old combat marines, there may be a little excitement. You know? Never matter. Doesn't mind. But there will be nuts in the end times. And they're, they're actually those squirrels that dream like to find nuts that they can feed on. Don't be fodder for the fools. Alright? There is nothing mystical about God's Word because He has foretold you all things. If you have meditated upon it, if you have studied it, if you have rightly divided it, then the Holy Spirit will communicate with you whereby you don't have to listen to a bunch of fruitcakes, okay? And they're out there. Hey, they're out there. Whoa. Next one, one to say, Father, expedite, expedite. That means, hey, hey. <laughs> okay, well, naturally, they're going to grow worse. I wanted to show you the same word. They're going to work better at it. So what does that mean you have to do? You've got to be sharp with food. So... Um, you know, I, I sometimes there's a type of person, oh yes, I've studied the book of Ezekiel. I studied it four years ago. Yeah, I did. I studied the whole thing from chapter 1 to the end. I don't need to go back there anymore. Show me a person will say that and I'll show you a fool. Because no man, this man or any other man, can understand God's Word. It's pregnant. And it grows all the time. And you've got to repeat, repeat, repeat to keep yourself up with prophecy that even transpires in current events. Or you're going to get left behind. So don't ever think that by covering a verse you know and understand all of it because God has a way of alleviating knowledge into your mind as you need it. Okay? Um, okay, I think um, we're going to go where now? We've got 2 Timothy, we've got verse 16. Let's go to chapter 3 now. And we're going to conclude here. I'm going to kind of quickly read the entire chapter. We're going to cover it to summarize this. And, We'll still be out of here on time, okay? Chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, verse 1. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. There's going to be trouble, okay? 
get set for it, you know. If you prepare for something, you're ready. It's going to happen. For men shall be lovers of them, their own selves, covetous, that means they, they, they lack money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, and unholy. Look around the world, pick up a newspaper tomorrow or today, and you talk about unholy people. Without natural affection, that means they don't uh, have affection to those that are naturally created by God to share affection with. Troubled truth breakers, I mean, you, can't, they won't, you don't try to take their word because they won't keep their word. False accusers, that's gossipers, incontinent, meaning without self-control, Furious despisers of those that are good. They like to make fun of Christians. They like to laugh at Christians. Hey, does that hurt you? Not at all. Okay. He who laughs last, <laughs> laughs least, most, loudest, best. We're not that kind of people. We're, we don't. So, we simply teach it. And when they hang themselves, they're hung. That's it. Okay? We're not going to laugh about it. Four, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. That's all we've got time for. Friend, look around you today. Having a form of godliness, they have to play church. I ask them to go to church every week. Yes. But denying the power thereof from such turn away. Our God doesn't do that either. He quit that with the apostles. You know God. Yeah, I do know God. He never changes. He's the same as he was yesterday. He is today. He will be forever. So don't ever let anyone tell you that God's powers have been left behind, changed. Do you know why they say that? Because they can't cut it. If God says, we have, um, you are able to overcome adversity, they can't come at the last times past. That was back when Christ. Oh, no, you can do it today. God doesn't change, so don't fall into that trap, okay? Verse 6, For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women. This is not a gender remark. It, it means, um, uh, well, laden with sins, led away with divers lust. What's wrong teachings? Well, it's so sensational. I like a little sensationalism every once in a while. Well, be careful if you do. All right? It will lead you straight to hell if it isn't biblical. You've got to learn to separate the wheat from the shaft or guess what your bag is going to be full of, friend? Verse 7. Ever learning. Well, I thought I knew it all already. I said Ezekiel once. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That, that can be all true. None of us come to the full truth, but some people like to play church, but do you know why they never come to the truth? Because they never study God's Word. It's always what somebody did here or some brother did there. I don't have to say that to you. You know what I'm talking about. Now, as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. You wonder what happened there. Moses had Aaron throw his rod down and it became a serpent. These magicians threw rods down and they became serpents also. There was just one big difference. Aaron's rod swallowed the others up whole. Okay? So what does that say to you? In the end times, there's going to be mystics done by Satan. He's going to work miracles. He's going to do some pretty fancy stuff. I don't know how you fixed, friend. You know a lie when you see one? Well, how would I know the different test the fruit? If it's Satan, it's wrong. All right? If it's the false Messiah, hey. But they shall proceed no further. For their folly shall be manifest unto all men. How many? All men, as theirs also was. Just like those back there that threw the, the rods down and Aaron's rod ate them up. It's going to be the same. I would not want you to miss the word, shall proceed no. 
This is what the word proceed is there in the Greek language. You got it. It's prokopta. In other words, they'll do it with force. Don't think they're going to let you just slide by. They're going to try you to no end. But they shall proceed no further. They're trying to go against the wind, turns into the Holy Spirit's not going to make it, okay? But they shall fu- but they shall fully, but thou, rather, hast fully known my doctrine. Isn't it amazing how concerning this word, the doctrine always comes right up, okay? Manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, and patience. Eleven, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me in Antioch, in Iconium, in Mystra. What uh, persecutions I endured. Hey, it was pretty tough. But out of them all, the Lord delivered me. I don't want you to ever forget that. When you think you can't cut it anymore, the Lord's about ready to deliver you. You know why? As it is written in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, He'll never put more on you than you can handle, and He will always show you a way out. Always. Do you have faith? Then don't worry. He will always deliver you and show you a way out. Believe Him. This is real. This is not a fairy tale. Verse 12, yea and, all that will, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You got that? You're going to suffer persecution. What does that hurt you? You're, you're, you're downtown. You're on Main Street. And you say, oh, there goes one of those Christians again. You say, you bet your sweet bippy. All right. Now, I didn't know what Bippy meant until a Canadian came down and told me. That means your outhouse. Okay. All right? So, you know, persecution bothers some people. You're proud of what you do. Hey, that's the, way, that's, that's the whole nine yards, son. Let her, let her rip. All right? That's right. You got it right. You know, and that turns on them, see? All right? Verse 13. But evil men... And seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, I've got some bad news for you. You may never realize that the word W-A-X, W-A-X could be the ax for you. Okay? But you got it right. It's prokopter. That's what the word is in the Greek. Why did they transfer it? Why? I thought that wax. Well, to me, that kind of loses. Because it means that evil men and seducers shall shift, zig, zag, push, shove, worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Not going to get any better, friends, so you want to get tough. Okay? When the going gets tough, the tough get going. All right? But don't ever worry. God will take care of you. That's what, that's what you have faith for. Right? Not just something, a word you say. Trust and believe. He'll take care of you. 14. We're about to here. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, from the Holy Spirit touching you and anointing you. With the Word of God, you can rest assured you don't have to waver. Don't let your heart grow faint. You're looking right around you at a bunch of winners. I mean, all the way, not part of the way, no turning back. We're going to take the next hill. I don't care how many hills Satan has, we're going to take them all. Because we will not waver. Why? We've got the victory. It's written. He has foretold us all things. We have nothing to do with that. So don't worry about putting yourself out a little bit. And don't get nervous if God decides, well, I'm going to test their metal just a little bit. I'm going to test their iron. I'm going to beat it a few times here. I think they need to be a little longer on patience here. That, that'll get you quicker than anything I know from experience, okay? Patience, patience. Women are pretty good at it, but men are not good at patience, okay? Now, I want it now, God. Okay. 
Uh, verse 15, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able, they're what? They're able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. It's going to get tough, friend, but God's word makes you able to take me dragon. It makes you a nice soldier in God's army whereby Satan and will run like 60 when you walk on the block. They don't want anything to do with you because you are disciplined in the Word of God and you take nothing from Satan or his people. 11. How do you do that? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof, that don't, don't take, don't just jump at some conclusion. Reprove it. It'll stand up. You don't have to worry. God's word doesn't contradict itself. Some men think it does, but they show how little they know about God's word. God's word never contradicts itself. For correction, it will correct you. For instruction in righteousness, seventeen, that the man of God may be perfect. That means fresh or complete helping people, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That's what God's Word will do for you. But I wanted that one word brought out because I think it loses a lot the way it's translated in English. But you've got to think. You've got to be able to, to um, again, is the word in the old nautical term, make headway in spite of the blow. Okay. That means the wind. Whichever way it's coming from, learn how to gain in, e in every case and let no obstacle stand in your way. Learn the obstacle, figure it, size it up, go under it, over it, around it, or through it. But do something and God will protect you. The etymology again, the old Greek metaphor. I like it. The smith's hammer on the anvil, every blow lengthens our iron. Uh, it makes a better person of it. That's kind of what Paul was saying. So, and I'm sure that's why he used the word so often. Is that the trials had made his iron stronger. You know, it had turned his iron to steel. And, he could cut it. He could do it. So, think. Stay focused. I suppose you hear me say that word, focus, focus, focus. My friends, it's important that you do, because there are others that want to dim your focus or to turn you out of focus into other things. Stay in the Word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of following you, Father, for the word. We thank you for Paul, Father. We thank you in the name of Yeshua Messiah, Jesus the Christ. Amen.